Behold, my creation, student. I fashioned this pillar of skulls from the heads of clever, resourceful people who can be useful once more. Now that they've been detached from their bodies, they can devote themselves entirely to serving you. Their advice will be wise and helpful. The pillar will ensure order in the ziggurat. It is time for me to proceed with my work. Your soul is almost ready to accept the power of death. My work in this task has been magnificent. In the meantime, you may greet your new servant. One of its heads may seem familiar. The lich's voice is full of malicious glee. Before you stands a pillar with reanimated heads resting upon it, their eyes glowing green. All have been stripped back to their shiny fleshless skulls, except for one that once belonged to an elderly man with a gray beard. The skulls greet you in unison, their whispers blending together in a chorus. Greetings, master. We are the pillars of skulls. We serve, you command. Upon inspecting the elderly man's head, you recognize Teldin, the museum custodian from the Tower of Estrad. His lips are crusted with dried blood, and a fat black fly crawls across his cheek. We were created to advise you to control the ziggurat, to serve as shepherds for the undead, to ensure your safety, and, of course, to help you assemble the grave guards. Use us as you see fit. Who are the grave guards? The Ziggurat's champions, its best guardsmen, the strongest, more than just skeletons and zombies, those who keep the defenses strong. Grave guards are never great in number. They are rare. They must be sought, collected, one by one, resurrected and subdued as long as their souls are strong enough. But they will serve you well when the Ziggurat is under attack. For one day, it certainly will be. Can you sense the souls of those who can become my grave guards? We sense rage. We sense shame. A powerful spirit, a suffering spirit, a traitor's spirit. He roams your dungeon. His god refused to claim his soul. Bind him. He will be useful. You enslave the spirit of Delamere, a powerful priestess of Aristil. Her arrows will defend the ziggurat well. Order her to come here. Stalton's corpse looks horrible. Two whitish orbs where normal eyes once were, rotten eyelids, the putrid stench of rotting meat. Flies are swarming the dead dwarf, eager to lay their larva in his flesh. Evil requires lich mythic path. Awaken Stalton from death. The corpse does not move, but you can sense Stalton's presence. His low voice resounds in your ears. Get lost. I'm dead. Mogram, the god of death, is waiting for me. He will deliver me onto Farazma's judgment. Me? I've had enough judgment here. No one will look at me with pity and disgust ever again. Go to the abyss. What do you want? Then again, I can feel it. You too want to use me. Forget it. Force Staunton to submit. The dead dwarf's body flinches. You hear Staunton's spectral scream. What the traitor once called his soul burst into green flames. No one can possibly withstand such torture. Enough! Stop it! I'll serve you, I'll kill for you, just stop. I'll atone for my crimes. And then perhaps you'll leave me alone at last, all of you. The dead dwarf stands up slowly as though he is carrying a mountain on his shoulders. With repellent creaks, his stiff joints start moving. Staunton's face, purple from post-mortem lividity, shows stern determination. The dwarf's low voice sounds even more grim than when he was alive. I'm at the ready, Commander, awaiting your orders. Stalton, you pathetic traitor. 
You brought down both yourself and your brother. The very sight of you disgusts me. A terrible grimace of suffering distorts the dead dwarf's face. I acknowledge my sins. I felt it when Mogren took Joran's soul to face Rasma's judgment. I want to see him again so badly, but I'm scared. Mogren will spit upon me and say that traitors like me are not welcome in his room barrel. I want to atone for my shame. I want to see Joran again. I'm sorry for what happened to you. You've been treated cruelly. The dwarf's face, grim as it is, hardens completely. I've no need for pity. My punishment is just. Then again, Galfrey is a cruel bitch. She's guilty as well. What would you do if you encountered Monago again? The dead dwarf growls, barely able to contain his rage. She swore her love for me. She promised she'd stay with me until the end. She drove me to treason. Now I'm dead, and that wretched bitch is still breathing. She'll pay for this. I have the right to seek revenge. Head to my cigarette and guard it. Will do. I won't surrender this fortress, not even to Discari himself. Burial rites fulfill several functions. They mitigate the psychological strain of parting with the deceased. They neutralize a source of disease causing miasmas, and they suppress the spread of cannibalistic and necrophiliac acts in society at large. There are many ways of disposing of a corpse, burning dissolution and harsh chemicals, ingestion by all members of the community, but by far the most popular method is burial. A grave protects the corpse against carrion eaters, serves as a place of remembrance, proclaims the merits of the deceased, and of his special importance. When all safety measures are taken, grave burial prevents the deceased from coming back and visiting their still living relatives. The commander examines the stone sarcophagus resting in the crypt of the Temple of Aristil. It was used as a feasting table for demons until very recently. Bones are scattered across the stone top of the sarcophagus. Some are easily identifiable as human finger bones. A human eyeball floats unappetizingly in a clay bowl and next to it lies a half gnawed rib cage. The commander decides, lower religion, examine the symbols on the sarcophagus. Professor Snape recognizes some of the symbols used by Kellett Priest. According to the symbols, in this sarcophagus lies a priestess of Iristil, Delamere, the Blessed. On the lid of the sarcophagus, the symbols form a circle. The commander notices that the seemingly solid slab is actually composed of several pieces in this spot. The hairline joins between the fragments are almost impossible to see. In Socorus, there existed a funeral tradition in which the priest would place magic seals such as this on tombs. The symbols on the seal are threatening. I guard the eternal sleep of Delamere. Cursed be any who dare to destroy me. The commander, evil, requires lich, mythic path, breathes life into the old bones and summons them into his service. Little green flames spark to life inside the empty eye sockets of the once blessed Delamere. With a crunching sound, the fingers of bone clench around the bow. Her body slowly rises from its sarcophagus and takes in the crypt with a hate-filled glance. From her gaping jaw emerges a wrath of vexation. Who has dared? The dead priestess glares at you, green flames raging in her empty eye sockets. What have you done to me? How dare you desecrate? Create my remains. With each word, air from her lungs whooshes out between her ribs. Pardon me, Professor Snape, but I see clear evidence that necromancy is wrong and dangerous for the world. You have taken a beautiful ancient legend of a devout priestess 
and turned it into an evil and horrifying parody. Bow before me, Delamere. Delamere's proud back slowly curves into a bow, and through gritted teeth, she hisses, Yes, master. Your temple has been defiled and your priest revealed to be a traitor. Delamere draws a breath like she's sniffing the air. My country, awash with corruption, demons, cities, they defy the soul. I was right. This cleric is nothing. I want to know more about you. The dead priestess sears you with her gaze. Can it be that my glory has faded and you do not know of Delamere the Blessed, priestess of Aristel, who carries his bow, which always flies true? Or do you mock me? They say you were a great priestess. Is that true? I served Aristel faithfully. I carried out his will. I fought against the filth of cities, human hives. People should not live like that. No one should. Corruption seeps from the cities. I was the protector of villages. I guarded them against marauders, against city swindlers, against internal strife, against too many people. I was known, feared, respected, loved. How do you feel in your new form? The priestess's voice trembles with rage. This is an abomination, a betrayal by her still. He has forsaken me. I can feel my own rot. I feel the corruption in myself. I would kill myself now, but it still abhors suicide and your will has bound me like a chain. Tell me about your armor and bow. Pride suffuses Delamere's voice. They are the gifts of Aristil. He sent his spirit to me, a white stag. Three days we vied with each other in stealth and speed, a noble fight. I did not eat the meat, but instead I offered it up to Aristil. And from the antlers I hid and made a bow and a breastplate. They saved me from Gurgans many times, and there were presents who were not in favor of me. They ambushed me on my travels, but their knives could not penetrate my armor, but my arrows pierced them clean through. I don't have any more questions. Delamere snorts haughtily and tries to offer a harsh retort, but the words stick in her throat, turning into a harsh rasp. I have a task for you. I will obey master, though being your slave is a torment. Go to my ziggurat and guard it. As you command, master, I will guard your fortress.